there was this potential for us to stand on the shoulders of our previous bands and then kind of like launch into the stratosphere. And, and that didn't happen. Welcome everyone to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. The Stereo was a pop rock and roll band started in early 1999 by former ska punk band frontman Jamie Wolford of Animal Chin and Roy Phillips of The Impossibles. The pair were initially brought together on recommendation of their label Fuel by Ramen. The duo released their debut album, 300, in the summer of 1999. Over their recording and touring history, the band endured a number of lineup changes. Singer-songwriter Wolford was always affiliated with the group and composed all selections on subsequent releases. The group disbanded in early 2004 with Wolford and bassist Chris Serafini, Seraf- yeah, I think I said that right, Chris, reconvening to form the band Let Go. In 2009, Alternative Press named 300 one of the 10 most influential albums from 1999 that shaped punk today. In 2011, the stereo briefly reunited with original members Phillips and Wolford to perform at Terminal 5 in New York City with Paramore, Fun, The Swellers, and This Providence to celebrate the 15th anniversary of Feel by Ramen. As typical intros go, I always talk about how I first heard of uh, the band or the person I'm talking to and uh, the stereo I heard about because of Robert J. Heiner of Lane Meyer slash Day at the Fair fame. Rob was a good buddy of mine and I think this was after our days of hardcore roller skating or rollerblading that he got this album. It might have been during that time. But he would always have this playing, and that's how he introduced me to it. Luckily, I got both Rory and Jamie on the Skype at the same time to talk about the uh, how they saw the band from back then and get their viewpoint. And uh, this is what we talked about. Their performance wardrobe, working for Fuel by Ramen, The Impossibles, Animal Chin, coming up with the name, their dynamic as a band, Rory's exit from the band, a podcast being in the works, and a ton more. Before we begin, a couple things. Uh, just go check out HouseOfMerch.com, which is run by Sean from Lane Meyer. You can find a ton of shirts from your favorite bands. The prices are super low compared to other websites out there. And you can take an extra 10% off by using the promo code SCENE. It's S-C-E-N-E. There's also free shipping. So again, HouseOfMerch.com. You got a lot of band apparel that you can buy stuff for yourself or your loved ones. You get 10% off by using the promo code SCENE. And there's free shipping. So uh, go do that and support support uh, Mr. Sean. Thank you for all the Patreon supporters who keep this podcast going. Again, I do apologize that Patreon is adding sales tax to the monthly fee. I just want to keep saying this a couple times in the next couple interviews just to let you know that's going to happen. It is just a couple cents extra a month, so hopefully it's not going to break the bank. But I did want to let you know because they had to make this policy change because the government was like, hey, Patreon, uh, we need to have you uh, pay sales tax which I guess I thought they were already doing, so whatever. But again, thank you for being a constant supporter on there. Also, thank you for all the people who have done a donation one time or a couple times or have bought merch. This helps keep the podcast going. So if you haven't and you want to, great. If you haven't and don't want to, that's also awesome. You could do all these things at thiswasthescene.com. If you have any questions about anything, you can email me at thiswasthescene at gmail.com. If you haven't followed the Instagram account, it's instagram.com slash this was the scene, or just go to this was the scene in your search bar. I don't really do anything on Twitter, but just post what the teasers are and the episodes. Facebook, I basically just regurgitate what I do on Instagram. So Instagram is kind of like the place you really want to follow. Uh, that's kind of it. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. I remember hearing about you guys, and it was like, when was it, 99? When the stereo, yeah, ninety nine, you guys yeah. formed, right? And I think that was the time. I think either you came through Jersey, but my buddy Rob, Robert Heiner, picked up your CD and he played it on fucking repeat all the time. And he's like, "This band is like a mixture." I think he called you guys had like, it's a very Weezer influenced. I think because at that time, anything slowed down with just like a downstrom or anything like that. Uh, I think it was either he compared that to you guys to Weezer, or is it, or it was like the Impossibles, where you're saying that was a mix between Weezer and Ska, and then Animal Chin was the same. Did you guys ever hear that back then? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, we've been called many things. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that first record, 
it kind of, I don't know. I mean, you know, Rory, he probably could chime in on this too. Like it, it hit a, um, a note on some level, like at the time, I think we both were kind of, you know, we were Rory's in the impossibles. I was in animal chin. Our bands split up and we got together to do the record and almost out of like, kind of like a, a knee jerk reaction against doing ska music. We wanted to do something that was just primarily rock. Right. Yeah. Or I should say against punk ska. We just wanted to drop the ska, but neither of our bands were necessarily like punk bands, I would say. So we, the types of things that we were listening to back then and, you know, my memory, whatever, but we, you know, we weren't necessarily listening to, we'd listen to Avail, right. As yeah. a, like a, a kind of an underground punk band or whatever, uh, uh, you know, and descendants, but we were kind of songwriter guys. We were into that stuff. So we were also listening to things that resonated in that regard. Like, you know, like Weezer would be one rivers is a, is a songwriter guy that kind of is, you know, in, in that, Closes him off, closes himself off in a room with a guitar and doesn't come out for a week. But then when he does return, it's like, here's 15 songs. You know, like we had that kind of like, my TV doesn't work, but I don't need it. I just have this guitar and I'm just going to spend the entire month just writing music. And so we'd listen to everything from like, I'd say like Cardigans, like that band, the Cardigans. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. To, uh, I was listening to like a lot of Chisel back then. What else did we listen to back then? Nothing. Just the cardigans. Just the cardigans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I, I mean, do, do you know what I'm talking about, Rory? Like, we had, like, that kind of, like, songwriter nerd thing that we were after. Yeah, for I don't sure. know. I, I mean, I think any band trying to play rock music after 1995 is going to be indebted to Weezer in, in one way or another. And they were definitely a, a huge influence on me and, and the band The Impossibles. And then I think when we got to the stereo, definitely had an influence as well. Most of the stuff I was listening to at that point would have been called like emo, like no knife. And oh, I love no you knife. Know, yeah. You introduced and, me to no knife. Yeah. So, I mean, that was kind of what I was listening to and I guess kind of influenced by, but I mean, when we were writing these songs, I remember also just pulling out references more from like childhood, like Rick Springfield and sure. You know, really just I what is, what does straightforward rock sound like in 1999? Yeah, but done by like indie independent bands, right? Right. I, I remember feeling like I wanted my influences or my sort of touchstone references when I would write music. I didn't want them to be like the band that I could go down the street and see next week. Like I wasn't going to be like, I love, I love the promise ring, but I wasn't want, I didn't want to like base my music off of like current peers. So I would like, I would have bizarre and I'm sure Rory and the guys in the band at the time would probably say, you know, I listen to like Boz Skaggs and weird ass, you know, 70s AM gold stuff. And, you know, and I could, I could point to certain songs from, like Rory said, from a childhood where I was like, I kind of like this little bit of this song right here. What if you'd like turned this into like a quote unquote stereo song? Like if we stereofied this goofy ass Eric Clapton song, like that nobody in our world would ever catch my, I, I, I liked going like way outside of the genre, you know, to use that word to find influence. And hopefully that made something kind of fresh, you know, and in some regards, you know, we, we were sort of accused of being like this radio rock thing. There was a lot of confusion about what the hell we were because we weren't like hot water music. Right? We were, we, you know, we kind of adopted the, like the all black clothing and, white album and then we had this music that like rory said kind of had a, like a rick springfield journey thing going on but we were like punks kind of and so it it, it yeah. some people i think sort of like mistakenly thought we were try, you know shooting for like trying to turn into celebrities or something and sign some big deal and you know ride off on horses or something like that but <laughs> we just wanted to make like kind of interesting nostalgic cool rock music that didn't necessarily adhere to some sort of guidelines or principles that other in my mind sort of like um closed-minded folks insisted upon us we just wanted to play what we liked and, and it, was, it was that gray area too between 
people really caring if you sold out or not. Yeah. And then, you know, four years later, that not even being a concept anymore. And, and you know, I think online music kind of changing everything and, and shifting everybody away from really having that mentality of like this band is are such sellouts or, or, or caring about that. We were sort of, that was we were definitely post sellout. <laughs> <laughs> we, it, there was a little bit of that, but there was also, it was starting to transition out of it. So there was, it, it's not like there was any violent reaction against us, but you know, for some people, I'm sure it was just kind of off putting to see a band trying so hard. Yeah. I think I, this is how I remember. And also, so I usually, I am going to bring this, we're going to go back a bit and like kind of see, talk about how you guys got into your original bands and like what music influenced you to start and then kind of go through that and lead into stereo. But I like where we're at the moment because, and I'm going to go bring it back. But what I, I remember vi- vividly, I remember the way I remember it is when you guys came out, ex- exactly how you said it, the, 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 the cover art was very striking to me because it was so clean and it was just straightforward as the, this is who we are. And it was like I had heard that you guys both came from both your bands and created this. And usually I always felt that when bands did that, that's when they created their successful band or sometimes it would fall on its face. But a lot of times bands would do that and it became the successful one because they had done all the, the shitty crap, you know, all the <laughs> shit first, like, you know, starting no, off. No, 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 no. There's you know? no end to that. We're, we are professional shitty crappers. <laughs> <laughs> and we make no bones about yeah, our abilities like, to yeah, crap you, some shitty crap. Yeah, but you you start off and you learn how to play your first show, and then you learn yeah. to, you know you learn that part of it, and then you learn what it's like to get merch, and then you got to buy your first band. So by the time the second band rolls around, all of that you've got it figured out. So you just like all the right, machine like is started. more oiled. Yeah, yes, exactly. there was absolutely, and that 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 what you're talking about that's an absolute real thing because my band after the stereo were like we were like we'll never make any of those mistakes and nobody gave a shit or whatever but we didn't make any of those mistakes so i guess that's good but like it you know there's also something lost i guess i don't know but no like if you go back to that first record we've got these piano songs all over the record we didn't really know how to play piano very well so we were still growing up on record in front of people to some degree. And it wasn't until, you know, I think probably the third stereo record where like, we kind of like, okay, well now we can, we're kind of like a pro band, but we were still sorting out all the youthful sort of stupidity things. And, but yeah, we were more informed than we were before, but you're never, you never stop learning how to do, do a band, you know? And, and I mean that from everything to like, like you said, you know, how do I get T-shirts and what do I, when I go to sell them, do I put them on the table or do I put them on the wall? Do yeah. I get a mannequin? You know, like all those dumb things that you have to figure out down to like, why can't I play G minor here? Well, it's not in G minor. Okay. You know what I mean? Like you have to have, come up with these sort of decisions based, you know, based off your taste. And, you know, some bands will break these rules and others won't. And and it's just about there. Everything is a tool that you choose to use a certain way. And but by no means did the stereo at that time have everything down. We might have looked like we had it a little bit more down, and and maybe that was our kind of like our secret weapon at the time. Yeah, you know the album cover. Again, to go back to the thing about like outside of the genre references, like that to me, that album cover is like kind of like a like a a um, a rip off of Fleetwood Mac Rumors. Like if you think about the album cover there, it's kind of oh, white yeah. background, and they're kind of like. In these like almost like ballet kind of things, and you know, McFleetwood's got the little balls hanging from his thing. <laughs> but like, <laughs> enjoy that. If you haven't seen that before, you're welcome. Your mind has just been blown. Um, but you know, we we were kind of like, well, how can we make something that looks beyond what we are right now? We want to look like we've spent tons of money on doing what we are, so that we look more serious to people but without actually spending a ton of money on things. So, because we're, we're that serious. We just need to convince everybody else. We are that serious. Well, it seemed like you were just on a fucking mission. That's what, when I saw that and I saw you guys, you were all black. So when you do that, you have a, that that's when a band has a conversation and they go, okay, like sure. 
we're going to go in this direction. And it was very apparent. But like you said, I'm sure on your end, you had way more people ca- talking to you and giving you either shit or praise about what direction you're going in. I remember myself. I saw funny those. now because everybody does that shit. Right. I'm yeah. not saying we invented black clothing or anything like that. We didn't. In fact, there's the bands <laughs> in our scenes that did that. But everybody Refused started doing, doing black clothing, yeah. you know? Yeah. It so was, like it was across the board. It was like you guys, but then the Refused did it and they were like super harder sound, but also very technical. They, I think they predated us. Yeah, I remember yeah, seeing I that. I video. think if anything, we might have even been like, well, they look cool. Let's do a little bit of that, you yeah. know, like. So and I and I came with so my previous band we had had worn uniforms on stage initially and it was kind of like part of our thing and I was always really into that idea of like putting effort into the presentation of the band and what we look like whenever we get on stage and looking like one cohesive thing so yeah I think fuck that, shorts <laughs> that yeah like that's the other the other direction right is like we we definitely could have done cargo shorts and you know the t-shirts of the bands that we toured with not to disparage that in any way shape or form i uh love a lot of bands that went that way it's just that for us there was a, a conscious decision to try and do something different and to try and make that effort show Yeah. I mean, all things being equal, right? Like everybody wants their songs to be great. Everybody wants to play them as well as they can. That's every band, right? Hopefully. Well, what could we do that was maybe a little bit different that the other guys, you know, on the bill weren't trying to think about? Like, and it was so simple. It was just like, well, just sort of, we we couldn't afford lights, couldn't, you know, smoke machines or anything like that. It was just like, well, just dress up a little bit, you know, like look a little... We look foreign on stage, and maybe people think we're a much larger band. <laughs> it did, but it worked. That's the thing. Is you that... didn't expect accents to go down, did you? <laughs> but here they are. Here taking, they are. We're taking this any direction we want to go in. That's fine with me. Yeah, but it's like you guys showed up, but that's the sound also matched the style. And I just thought, when I said you guys were on a mission, for me, I thought it was like, I respected that, even though that was a time when it was that whole sellout bu- bullshit, which I was preaching at the time too, which I've said many times, like 17 year old me being like, fuck that, I'm never selling out, I'm not going to get paid ex- excess money from my music, which is just insanely stupid. But I remember, <laughs> like, there was bands that I'd look at and say, fuck that band. Like, when Face to Face did their their self titled record, we all got kind of mad at them for no fucking reason at all. And, like, and I, <laughs> you looking back, I love that record. But then there's other bands where they, would come out and I was like, I respect that for some reason. I don't know why I'm not mad. But when you guys came around, it's like, yeah, like these guys have it together and it's more polished, the look, the sound, all of that. And I was just like, go for it. Because there was such a, the buzz was, the buzz that I caught was that the, the two of you guys came from the Impossibles and Animal Chin and did this band. That was the whole thing. And then you guys created this thing and took off and you're on Fuel by Ramen at that time where, like Fuel by Ramen had all already been established and any other band on that, it's like just getting on that label gave you clout and and then moving forward. But weren't both your bands That's crazy. On that? It's crazy because we we were Rory and I were kind of like always on that label, right? Yeah. So we probably had we were a little blind to how cool that was to everybody around us, you know? Um and 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 that's not disparaging them. That's like we just I don't think we, at the time, I don't think we really understood what we had because I'm sure there was a shit ton of bands that would have loved to been doing what we were doing. You know, they were, they, it wasn't a major label, but it was like they were paying royalties, they were making records and they were putting us out, helping us, you know, get out on the road. Like what else is there? You know, yeah, I, I mean, grant, granted, there's a shit ton <laughs> left, but like, uh, but that, but as far as we knew at the time, we're like, this is great. This we're living it. Yeah, so, I, I absolutely took Feel by Roman for granted because they were the only label that I had ever been on, and so I thought every label was like Feel by Roman and had like a super capable head that was running running the show, and things, you know, everything was uh, a really tight ship. It wasn't until after Feel by Ramen working with other labels you find out, oh no, actually that's extremely rare and I should have appreciated more of that whenever I had it. Yeah, well, I think from now that have you as you say that cuz I was in a band at that time in Jersey and we didn't what it was, you know, grass is always greener. So I'm sure there was bands that you guys looked up to where you wanted to get to so you never see where you are or you 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 know sometimes you appreciate where you are but from my perspective, being in a band, going on tour, and really struggling, 
even though I loved it. And then I'd see bands like you guys or a lot of bands at the time who were a, a giant leap from where we were. That's when I'd look at labels like Fuel by Ram and be like, fuck, they're on that. Or what were the bands? Like even ba- like labels like Big Wheel at the time or Doghouse Records or right. you know, they were like just, I felt like those labels were like, like on the same levels feel by Rama, but then you'd have the fat records and epitaph, which would be the, you know, comparison to like the Capitol records or universal, whatever those labels were. It's like, they were like the big ones. And, um, yeah. So I think just from my eyes of being in a band being like, fuck, I want to get on a label like that's so bad, but you guys are on it. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, that's well, cool. and again, to go back to what we were talking about earlier about sort of like, you know, uh, greasing the optics or whatever, we, we, you know, I was the, the, the kind of creative director, graphic designer, whatever you want to call it, at, of the label at the time. Rory did all like the website stuff. So we were kind of in, in some ways, uh, we had uh, our hands deep in the, in the, uh, the, um, behind the, the scenes, the, 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 what am I trying to say? The visuals of the label. Hmm. We had, we had control over how things looked and not just our, our albums, but other albums too. And like the, you know, like the samplers that they would put out. So, you know, it, it all sounds sort of in hindsight, it sounds real, you know, like like we hit we, you know, we had our hands on the wheel. We we I don't think we did, but at the same time, like we had an influence on things. So we could do things where we we could look around at other bands and other labels and be like, Oh, this is just what are they doing? You know, this looks like so podunk or whatever. And then we could be like, Well, let's make let's make our Fuel by Ramen sampler look like the Interscope Records sampler or whatever. And we would do that. And so it gave this perception to you and and, and other people that things were better than they are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we were probably doing the same things as, uh, you know, 10,000 other bands. Not that there were 10,000 other bands in, in the world back then, but we were in a van driving around, eating Taco Bell, playing to like 20 to a hundred people or whatever. And then, you know, rinse and repeat. But when you look at our albums and our, the, the things that we were doing at the time, right. And if you look, go back and look at it now, it's sort of like dated. Right. But at the time it was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. Like, you know, th- th- these guys must have it going on. You know, yeah. I was, I always make the joke that, you know, if you ever go up to someone or you, you're introduced to someone as a person in a band like oh this is my friend blah 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 he plays in a band right like 99 percent of the people that encounter that statement about you go oh cool right but if there's mention of an airplane like oh this is my friend rory and he's uh he's in this band called the stereo he's flying out to virginia next week or he's flying out to phoenix to record some vocals or whatever oh really really what's out in phoenix you know like people have an interest because there's an airplane yeah it's that like that slight little bit of yeah. extra sort of like credibility to what posh. you're doing yeah oh this is this, this is rory he's uh, he's he just got back from six month tour oh right that like those little bits of like extra information go to kind of lend sort of like the nod of like they're not you're you're the local dicks down the street that you know play in their garage they're doing something a little bit more than that and everything that we tried to accomplish sort of had that slant from our albums and the our clothing and you know, the stuff that we did for Fuel by Ramen. So I feel like if, if we did offer anything in the way of help to Fuel by Ramen, we helped present them in a way that made them look bigger than they were at the time. And whether or not that ultimately paid off, I have no idea. No idea whatsoever, but maybe. Well, it depends on, it depends on what your definition of paid off. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, so how did you guys, I, I'm not going to actually, I usually will go back to your kidding, how you got into music. I'm going to actually skip that because I want to find out like, so both your bands though, you said you're both on Feel by Ramen. Like I want to just go like a tiny bit before that and talk about like just a little bit of how those bands, how, like, you know, st- why you guys were in the, like how you guys got in those bands and how you guys found each other or and like how they disbanded and how you guys formed the stereo. So like just like a little bit before you started those bands. I know it's a very deep question, but <laughs> which there's this guy in Florida named Lou Perlman. <laughs> Is that his name? The guy back. Wow, yeah, a guy. Back, Backstreet Boys reference, dude. I'm going Insane. full deep outside cut. genres. Total deep accents. Cut. The whole thing's <laughs> happening. This was the scene. 
Backstreet yeah. Boys. <laughs> yeah. I think this is the origin story. There's a documentary about that guy, actually. Did I get sure. the name right? Is it yeah, Lou, Lou Pearlman? Pearlman? Oh, yeah. That sounds right. Yeah, that big guy with the glasses uh, and blonde hair. Yeah. yeah. So for uh, for my band, um, so we, we, yeah, so sorry. I'm Rory. I was in a band called The Impossibles. There we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we got together kind of out of high school, high school friends, um, really were super lucky, became very popular, popular locally and got on the radar of, uh, Vinny from less than Jake. And then that's how we ended up on, on fuel by ramen records. Um, that whole, you know, we did, did qu- uh, quite a bit of touring nationally. And one of the shows that we played was in, in Indianapolis. And we, when we played that show at a pizza place, uh, that was the first time that we played with Animal Chin, which was Jamie's former band. I uh, am Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> just want to be like you, Rory, and say my name again. Yeah. Uh, and we were blown away. Like, Animal Chin were incredible. So much energy. So good. Uh, so <laughs> good. Handsome. Really, so handsome. Really doing something different than any of our our peers were doing. What and, was that? And though? also, what, what were they doing? So the best way that I can kind of put it, like my impression was like, wow, th- these guys are playing ska, but it's, it's got this like propagandi influence on it where it's, it's, uh, political and, you know, angry sometimes, uh, you know, who I, else was doing that pretty well at that time? Propagandi. <laughs> <laughs> propagandi famously, uh, famous for the song ska sucks, uh, and Jamie yeah, song and yeah, Jamie and, and like, Animal Chin went, no, it don't. And then we... <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> so Propagandi's never going to be a ska band, right? Okay, right. cool. Animal Chin. This. We got this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was incredible. And so from there, we we pl- started playing more shows with Animal Chin. Uh, I always really respected Jamie as, as a songwriter. And I think we were both sort of the... Svengali's of our uh, respective yeah. bands, right? Like we were the songwriters, and uh, for all intents and purposes, kind of kind of led those bands, right? So the Impossibles ended up breaking up for just kind of the generic reasons that most bands that start in high school end up breaking up. People wanted to go to school. Uh, people were just kind of sick of of being on the road. Ska had kind of waned as a uh, a popular music genre. And so it all just kind of climaxed and, and ended up with uh, that band stopping. And then in, at that point, I was still wanting to do it. I wanted to keep going. I kept writing music. I shared some of the music that I was writing with John Janik, who was the uh, head of, of Fuel by Ramen Records. That led John to have the insight to say, hey, wait a minute, you're doing this thing. I also know that Jamie from Animal Chin is writing new songs. What if you guys did something together? Mm-hmm. And that's how Hollow Notes was formed. <laughs> <laughs> but did clearly, you guys, I am Oats. <laughs> did you guys like? Did you guys have like? How did you not know that? It sounds like were you a fan of each other's bands or from afar? Oh, yeah. But like, oh, oh yeah, or were no, you guys we had buddies? heard about. Well, both. Like we, we, we. Uh, I heard about the Impossibles through Dan from MU330, okay. and he was like, "You got to check this band out. They're like Weezer ska." I was like, "Okay, cool." There we you go. Know, <laughs> Told you. You know, well, let's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what he said to me. I was like, "Oh, that sounds cool." And then we and like and I don't think I actually got anything to listen to until I met you guys. I can't remember, but as soon as I met, you know, as soon as we played that show in Indianapolis or wherever it was. Was it Indianapolis? But I have no idea where it was. I'm mean, just assuming 100%, you're right. 100%. Yeah. 100%. That's right. Rory's I'm, I'm like uh, Steel Trap Memory Phillips. <laughs> that's what we used to call him. Um, <laughs> sorry. Steel no, but, uh, Trap uh, Memory Phillips. <laughs> yep. That's the, it really rolls off the tongue. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> Very short. Um, no, but he, um, they were so, like, okay, so Animal Chin, you know, to kind of, to, push back against some of the the compliments that that Rory gave us. We were all about trying to sort of be like a fierce like sort of, you know, angry 
little 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 trio of punk ska kids, right? Um, and while I, you know, I, I was into songwriting, into all those these bands and this sort of thing, I really like wanted us to have like almost kind of like a like I was more about the live sound of our band, trying to be tight and like like have gaps in our music and like have it just be really just sort of like different sounding to people when they were in the room with us, right? Which is sort of a weird goal to have, whatever. But then when I saw The Impossibles and I was like, and Rory's band flipped me on my head, right? They were like, it was all about music and song. And I was like, oh, okay, we're totally doing this wrong. This is the way, like I kind of had seen the vision I needed to see in somebody else. And like the, their songs were so catchy and they just hit, they tugged on the heartstrings. And I was just like, this is, this is what I want to steer us towards doing. And, and we, we started, you know, the next batch of songs that Animal Chin did probably had a lot to do with like post listening to the impossibles as, as much as like Rory and I are kind of like, we can be isolated in our songwriting efforts. I do think that we had an influence on each other. It certainly had an influence on me. So when Animal Chin went down in flames and, you know, I kind of talked to John and I don't remember if John was telling you first or telling me first or how it happened, but I know that John was involved in sort of bringing us together. I was very excited and I was like, okay, I want to hear what he's doing because this is so great, you know, and, and, and when it all started happening, it seemed like he and I were sort of on our own. We kind of came to the same conclusion about what kind of music to play, but still through the filter of our own personal tastes to, to a degree. But, you know, like like 300, the song 300, and then the, like the song Devotion, one's written by Rory, one's written by me. They definitely sound like written by the same two people, but we both yeah. had those songs apart from each other. Um, so we, it was, you know, I don't know, you want to call it fate or anything like that. We, when we, when we sort of landed together, it, it just seemed like the right fit at the right time. And yeah, the impossibles were a ridiculously big influence on me, obviously to a degree where I was like, I want to be in a band with that dude. And I want, to, I want his songwriting abilities to link up with mine. And, you know, I'm th probably at the time I was going dude, if we had two guys like this doing this stuff, like, holy shit, best records ever. Right. And that's. When when it's a game of numbers like that, it's like you know, if we have more, then we have more, you know. Like so. <laughs> and for me, I, I always loved two singer bands. The Impossibles was a two singer band. My favorite band at the time was Fugazi. Mm -hmm. So the idea of starting a band with another singer was right right up my alley. Like that's exactly what what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So the, the next thing you know, Jamie drove to Austin, Texas, and we started cutting demos for that first record. Did you? Yeah. Did you feel like, because I guess like when I see, I hear about like the two of you guys respecting each other's bands, um, it reminds me of like the singer in my band, he had like a bromance with this guy, Josh, and this band Humble Beginnings. And um, did you guys ever, did you guys ever tour with Midtown? Yes. Uh, yes. So yes. Gabe, his first band was Humble Beginnings and he, oh, okay. he left that band. So, but uh, Josh was the singer for that band. So like Chris and Josh had this thing where, they would be like, dude, that song's so fucking good. But it made them like want to push themselves to write better songs or they would like steal part, not steal parts, but they'd be like, I love what you fucking did there. So did you guys find that? Cause did Animal Chin, how many, how many albums did Animal Chin do? I can't find any. Like I, I even went on Spotify. You guys yeah, like, that's, 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 weird. That, that's the way it should be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we did a full length that kind of like disappeared and I'm perfectly kind of happy to allow that to remain. Uh, as, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I love all the kids agree. Is that like, like the really, great. it's like it's the very great record in Russia. Yes. Very, like very the, popular. Like the embarrassing seventh grade <laughs> photo that you never want to serve. Yeah. It's totally, it's the mullet of my career. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, not even. You there's, know, it's funny. I have a guy screaming that, listening to you say that right now. I, I yeah, bet people are probably listening. Dude, like, there's a guy, this, this this poor guy, J Jeremy Myers, I think his name is, and he contacts me like annually. I'm not even joking. Like he did last week, <laughs> and he's like, "Hey, just checking in. If you want to like reissue that on vinyl, I'm totally down to do it." And I'm just like, "Oh man, you know." And I keep going. So I, I like I, the only way that I would like that record to kind of come back is if I could get a chance to remix it, and I have it, but it's just there's like 
a, a, just a metric fuck ton of things going on in my life right now. I just yeah. had a baby and all these things. And I'm just like, and, mm-hmm. and every time he kind of pokes his head out of the water and goes, Hey, do you want, you know, I'll put out that record on vinyl. I'm like, this is the worst possible time you could ask me annually. It always just <laughs> coincides. So I'll just go, just hit me back in a year. Surprise me. You know what I mean? Like, and maybe I'll, I'll be ready, but, um, it, it could come out. We'll, we'll see. It, 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 it depends a lot on whether or not I have a free couple of weeks kind of thing. And that's usually with four kids and, you know, like job and, and then mixing and producing bands. And it's like, it's like, it, it, it's like, it, it's making me tired just talking about it. Yeah. I can, um, uh, yeah, I but, totally um, get it. And then Animal Chan had a kind of like a, an initial EP and then a final EP, which then got combined into a full length album called 20 minutes from right now. And that record's kind of cool. You know what I mean? Well, did you find when that came? Did you did that come out after, or those two EPs come out after you saw you met the Impossibles? The like the the kind of the, the compilation EP thing. Yeah, like did you write those songs? So my, my what I'm trying to get to the, is that the like first, my, yeah, the first six songs on Twenty Minutes from Right Now were post Rory, post Rory's existence, post <laughs> Steel Trap Memory Phillips his awareness. <laughs> Etude. Um, and so like, there's probably a couple of spots on that record that are like those hits right there. That's such an impossible move. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm certain the first song has got some Dan, Dan, you know, like total breaks Phillips action going on there. Yeah. yeah. Um, not every song. There's one song that's like total, like Valoria by the Pixies and whatever, but yeah, th- there's definitely an influence there. And then, but then after those six songs, and that EP came out. In fact, I actually, Rory, if I'm not mistaken, the Impossible's anthology and 20 Minutes from Right Now, we, those were all designed at the same time, and they came out after the stereo had started. Right. Am I wrong? Yeah. No, I was in Minneapolis when you were designing the artwork for the Impossible's anthology, and we got it. Those songs mastered off of DAT tapes from uh, right. at a place that where. There was a guy that you know that could do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, uh, <laughs> so we yeah, were, no. we were like scooping up the ashes of our former bands and putting out the final releases as we were trying to start this new thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't exactly remember how what the timeline was, but but it was in that m- month or two month period where you were staying in Minneapolis with me, and we were doing, we were reissuing. Not, what, I, guess, I don't know if it, repackaging or all the uh, impossible stuff into one collection and then the remaining fuel by ramen stuff into one collection for animal chin as well so right did an impossible's record come out after you saw animal chin Rory? not yeah. too much later right yes no return definitely was was post animal chin they uh, you and know that was I, post stereo too though right uh yes i'm sorry <laughs> steel trap <laughs> steel trap Phillips. The steel trap was rusted shut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, uh, we didn't put out any records uh, post uh, post Animal Chin. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess it, really. I mean, obviously, you guys formed a fucking band. I mean, anything post Animal Chin. Whatever. What records can you actually call records after hearing that band? I, was, I mean, come on. I was so d- dissuaded so from wanting to put out any new music after seeing Animal Chen and knowing that it would be completely pointless that what? I right. It's funny you say that because Jamie is like basically saying those albums are shit and you're saying like <laughs> I, this was so I, great. I love those records. Yeah, no, I, th- I think they're incredible. Oh, thank you. I'll just take a compliment and move on. <laughs> well, how did how did you not know then that he was writing so Rory, how did you cuz you said that uh, the dude at Fuelds had said that oh, fucking Jamie's writing songs right now. It sounds like you guys weren't really like keep in touch, or how'd you not know that? I mean, we I think we mostly saw each other whenever Animal Chin would come to Austin. They would always play with the Impossibles, and and you know this was pre internet. I think it's worth calling out. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, staying it, in it, touch at that point, right? It was kind of like phone calling letters. Calling it was a long distance phone, phone call. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like like I'm I'm not going to pay MCI a uh, hundred dollars to to keep tethered to Jamie uh, back in right. those days. <laughs> Who but, would? 
<laughs> so so yeah, we we weren't super in touch, and so that's how John kind of becomes the the crossover point because he was talking to Jamie and and he was talking to me, and at the time too, just to hear the music that Jamie was doing involved, you know, physically mailing a CDR to me to be able to check it out. So it's right. like there was. There were a lot of I don't of even know if I had a over. CD burner back then, though. I probably sent you probably a cassette. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I was uh, I was four tracking my demos pretty pretty intensely. Did you guys yeah, get um, kind of like a moment where once you had that conversation, you were like, "Oh shit, I didn't. This is I wasn't expecting this, but fuck, I really hope this works." You got chocolate <laughs> in my peanut butter. Yeah, no, no you got dude, it, it was the next day. I, I'm pretty yeah. sure once I finally spoke to you, Rory, I got in the van the next morning. It wasn't, yeah. there wasn't a delay of oh, wow. any kind whatsoever. And from the time we said, okay, let's do this to me knocking on your door in Austin, I'm not even joking, was like 24, 36 hours or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. I, I drove alone with my gear in my van to, to uh, Austin, Texas. From where? And I did it from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Jesus. Oh, I-35, baby. That's Straight shot. John. drive. Uh, well, whatever. When you're when you're 24, whatever I was, yeah, like shit you know, dry. <laughs> no, I was kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just coasted. It just kept it neutral, and I slept. Um, no, I didn't. Kids, <laughs> learn how to drive. Put the yeah, phone down if you're allowed out of your house. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ever do get allowed out of your house, just you know, take it easy. Uh, no, and, and then like the very, I showed up and knocked on the door. Where I was like, okay, cool. Let's go get some Kim Fung. He introduced me to Kim Fung, which is sort of like our, our staple meal while we made the record or the demos, uh, which is a, like a Vietnamese place, right down in Texas. And we did that. And then the next morning we just set everything up and we started rocking, you know, we played each other's songs for each other or, or our songs for each other. And, you know, just went, okay, this is cool. This section here, let's replace it with this idea. You know, we just sort of like went through it. You know, like it was really a pre-production thing. We didn't have all 13 songs or whatever we had. So we wrote a few from the sort of the kind of the starting points of the little, you know, the initial nuggets of other songs that we had. I think I had like eight complete ideas that I brought with. But then by the time... We were done. I probably had about nine or something like that, you know, by being down there. And then there was like a couple of like little like weird ideas that didn't really they didn't make the record. You know, we had some, like some acoustic songs and stuff like that. But we recorded this thing and I think it was like 15 demos and we mixed it. We made a CDR and we started sending it out. And then John was like, OK, let's let's do this. And then <laughs> so then we made the wise choice to drive back to Minneapolis <laughs> <laughs> because there's no microphones in in Austin, Texas. You know, we should probably go to where the microphones are most cold at that time of year and, you know, make a record up there. And basically it was like, okay, I worked out of this place that we can get a good deal at. We recorded the last Animal Chin thing there. Like, let's go there because we can get, we can kind of lock it in and do a good job. Uh, and then we just we drove back up and same thing. We probably took a day to recuperate and then we did like a 10 day sprint or something to that effect 14 days i don't even know and we just recorded the album as fast as we could basically just redid everything we had just done the weeks prior but this time we did it with more care and that's the record you hear so what was kind of go back to the moment where you're both sitting at that restaurant in austin and you guys are just like geeking out on like where you can go with the band like do you remember that that those like that conversation or those conversations where you just sit there and be like okay this is how we're going to structure the band or this is how we're going to tour or here's my vision what are your thoughts i don't know if we had that conversation that quickly i don't know i, I remember having the band name conversation but that was like after we had kind of started completing some music i don't know rory yeah, I, I I do vividly remember sitting in Kim Fung and talking about the band, but we still, I think we're still kind of feeling each other out, and I, yeah. I don't know that anybody kind of like laid out the manifesto for what what the whole thing was going to look like. A lot of it kind of came as we went along and realized what was possible. You know, when, once we got to the point of building a white background in Jamie's living room to make the the album cover. Yeah. And like realizing like, hey, we can actually 
by hook and by crook, like get this together and make it look really awesome, then it kind of plays more naturally into, okay, well now here's what the aesthetic for the band should look like. And yeah. here's, here's the rest of it. Well, it sounds like it was yeah, a very it wasn't clean like... aesthetic. It sounds like just the album cover, the name, the sound, the way you dressed. <laughs> I mean, and, and the it's, name it's... was funny. Tell them the nor- the name story, like the, like how it how we were like, well, definitely we had our definitely our <laughs> don'ts that we did not want to end up with. Which yeah. were? Would you wait? Can you say some of those? A band that does not start with the letter S. There, there are too many bands that start with the letter S. So that was like laid out up front. That was one of the first ones. At the time, there was also, uh, you know, when you go into a record store, there's what bands are going to be close to you in the bins and like how far down the bins your your record is going to be and things that sound completely ridiculous at this point. You know, it's search like engine late op- 90s. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, it's like late 90s SEO. <laughs> <laughs> search engine optimization. Holy shit, record was, store optimization. Yeah, yeah we were, you know, if we had known, I think the stereo is maybe like the most useless search uh, term that you could possibly try and throw into a uh, search engine. Yeah. But, but we didn't want an S, and we didn't want to start a band with the. We're like, just, yes. as long as this doesn't do either of those things, we'll be stoked. <laughs> really held true to but that. It just it, it came down to I think like actually like mono was was something that I liked just as a as a term or a prefix for something, mm-hmm. uh, and then through kind of talking it out, we talked more conceptually about the left channel and the right channel, and and we've got you know two songwriters in the band, so we could kind of have this conceptual thing built into the name and call it the stereo and have it, ah. you know, make sense in, in some sort of way. I never thought of it like that. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. We, we very much were like, because we were in this, like, you know, we were, both of us were like sitting side by side, hovered over this like four track that was about the size of a laptop. Right. Maybe a little bit bigger. I'm not sure. And so we're like, we're shoulder to shoulder all day long, just, oh, I'm going to touch that thing and you move that there. Like, okay, you put your guitar to the left, I put my guitar to the right. And by the way, this is apparently how we sounded. <laughs> it's, I told you there'd be accents, right? And so we're always panning our guitars so that you could hear each guy's thing, you know? And so yeah. you're left, I'm right, or, or I'm left, and you're whatever it was, right? And so there was, it was sort of like on the, 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 the concept was like kind of right there, and we are just dancing around it all day long, every day, like moving our, our, our performances to one speaker or the other, you know, and we had these, we had these weird sort of like, okay, if it's my song, I'm playing bass. And if it's your song, you're playing bass. Do you know what I mean? We had, and, and we shared, shared the vocal duties fairly evenly or I maybe without sort of like rules like that, but we just had these like, sort of like, sort of, methodologies that when we came when it came time to talk about the band name it just sort of like like as soon as we started saying the stereo i think actually it was stereo at first because like rory said i think we initially talked about mono and we're like well what about stereo because it's sort of like what we're talking about earlier today and and then i don't know if it was him or me the stereo and then we probably laughed and went oh it's got the and s perfect and then (laughs) but then we kind of like looked at each other we're like does really nobody have that name by the way and then so at through that conversation we left kim fung we went to a record store we walked up to the dude and we're like do you have anything by the stereo and he's like "Hmm, i don't know i've not heard of that let me look it up or whatever and i don't know if there was like a book or a computer or anything at that time but he i think he might have asked jeeves or something like that (laughs) um (laughs) Nice and he said, no, I don't have anything on, on file for the stereo. And to us, that was the copyright we needed. And we're like, ah, t- trademarked, done. We're the stereo. And that was it. It's it was like about were, as it's like you were organic. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was on Ask Jeeves, you know? Jeeves. So do you guys like, sorry, I didn't let you finish that thought there. I cut you off. No, no, no. There's no, there's no thoughts that are finished with me. They're just continuous. <laughs> <laughs> Rory, you said, you said like you were going to add something there. Uh, I wasn't, oh. but thinking about Jamie as an Aurora Boros of thought is <laughs> blowing my mind. Right. Just Dude. glowing <laughs> and sitting there silently.
I think, to be honest, I think there are there are probably times which I was just like, I could give two shits about the scene. I just want to make this music, and if people like it, great. If not, n- also great. Go listen to someone else. That's fine by me. I don't care. And I still kind of have that attitude about that things at times. But then there was obvious. It, I would be stupid to not acknowledge though that that the the kind of the underground punk scene is how I did all of this shit. You know what I mean? Like it, it was right. the infrastructure in which I, you know, it was the street I lived on. So to be like fuck my neighbors is is a little bit uh, uh, short sighted as well. So. You know, it it depends on the day you ask me. If if somebody had said the stereo sucked that day, I'd be like, "Fuck you guys!" But but if they were like, "We love the stereo. You guys are the best." I'm like, "Isn't it great to be in this world and this scene?" You know, so it's probably just that sort of thing. But I I I can remember feeling apart from everybody because of what we talked about earlier. Because we were trying to do something a little different, but at the same time, still going and getting driving to those shows and getting up in front of those people and trying to convince them that we were cool enough to like. So you can enjoy the contradiction that is us. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's always sort of a mixed blessing, right? Like you, like when the scene does something like rejecting the, the new jawbreaker record, which is amazing. Yeah. And you just want to tear your hair out and be like, Oh my God, w- like, why are you, why is everyone so mad? I don't get it. I, but at the same time, like Jamie said, it's like you don't get a hundred or two hundred kids to a VFW if there's no scene, if there's no connection between those people and, and those kids, and so it's, it, you know, it's it's double edged, and I, I I think Jamie's spot on that we owe a ton to them. I think at the time, the same way that. As you get older, I think you always look back and feel like you took took things for granted and maybe didn't realize how good you had it. I think there's definitely a, an element of that uh, now in in hindsight. But for the stereo as a, as a band, I think we thought maybe at times, you know, this is the the scene is is a great place to get started, but there's eventually going to be a launching point where we can kind of get past it. I don't know and have it be about, you know, I just wanted, and I'm sure Rory, you probably felt the same. Like you didn't really care who liked the band, but if you liked it, that was great. Like, boy, mission accomplished. Right. I don't care if you don't like it. I super care if you do. do. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like I was vying for your love but if you did love it, I was going to be your friend. You know what I mean? So I, I sort of had this rejection of like, these like the, like you know the job the anti jawbreaker sentiment these principles that meant more than like logic, in the sense that jawbreaker makes a great record. I mean it ha- even happened to Nirvana, you know. I mean like and uh, and but it was too big to ignore. But I can remember I remember doing this. I remember being in high school and being like when Nirvana went huge. I went. I have been listening to music like this for the last eight to 10 years or whatever, you know, since I was a seventh grader or something like that. Right. And now these like football players are like singing it. And it it, like felt like somebody busted into my room and started picking up my stuff and looking at it and putting it back in the wrong place. You know what I mean? There was this weird protection I had over things. So I do understand it, but like jawbreaker wasn't, first of all, they weren't Nirvana level and Nirvana had been out for a good tick. Right. And he, you know, Kurt Cobain had passed in 94 or whatever. So when this shit was going down with Jawbreaker and. Computer just rebooted. He just texted me. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, Jamie said, told me to finish his thought. Finish his thought. Jamie's uh, computer just shit the bed. Uh, Rory, uh, become, become <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> no, I, can, I, I, I can still ask you questions right now, too. Yeah, well, I actually wanted to build on something that that we were talking about as far as like, you know, the the quote unquote scene. I think it's important to realize that we came from the ska scene. Yeah. So we had had not only been a part of a scene, but we had we had actually experienced that scene having a shelf life and having a peak and and having a fall off. And I think that that is important to keep in mind as we're starting the stereo and stuff. We definitely uh, wanted to be a part of the scene and the the bands and the connections that we made were were 
uh, gold, but we also knew that that sort of thing could be temporary and, and it could uh, rise and fall. And so I, I don't think we put a lot of stock in trying to be the kings of the scene or, or try to, um, you know, capitalize on it in, in that sort of fashion. And I, it's just, you, you ha- there's a very particular perspective that you get coming from that scene of ska bands where it becomes extremely cool, or I don't know if it was ever cool, but <laughs> extremely popular. <laughs> uh, and, and then also has a, a huge fall off and becomes super passe. Uh, and I think that, that gives you, I don't know if it made us embittered about it, but it definitely, uh, gave us a different perspective than a lot of the bands that I think were coming up as we started the stereo and we started touring with those bands. Was there, like, there was a question that kind of popped in my mind, because you guys, you started off on some pretty decent-sized tours, right? Or did that take a little bit of time? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, we our first tour that we ever did was with the band Dynamite Boy. I don't know oh, if you remember that, yeah. that pop punk band from Austin, Texas. Oh, that's right. Uh, We rented a van, we drove out to California, we played to absolutely no one, and then when we were in California, the hood flew off of the car that was two cars in front of us and smashed into our windshield of our rental van. And that was, (laughs) so it was, we were birthed by fire into uh, the touring life, Uh, and the fact that that we wanted to keep going after that, I I think, really shows the determination, because... Uh, it would have been pretty easy to get dissuaded from that path, having that sort of experience happen to you. But no, it, it, we we absolutely started off playing to nobody. Then the local popularity came to the Impossibles, and then we were able to kind of build off of that. And like Chicago was the first city outside of Texas that really embraced us. And once that happened, you know, you've kind of got Austin, Houston, and Chicago as you know, main points to be able to hit every couple of months, then we're able to kind of go all over the place. We didn't end up on in New Jersey that often though. I, I think um, the East coast was not really, you know, for one thing touring in the winter on the East coast is just a, a slog and you're taking your life into your own hands, trying to, to drive on ice and snow. Uh, so I think that, kind of had something to do with why we didn't end up going up there all that often but also just maybe not quite as many venues i like i remember playing in new jersey in a vfw um but i don't really remember playing any clubs yeah i was gonna say i think i think i remember you guys playing and i think no it wasn't with ultimate fake book that was a different show uh there was a one of the popular venues there was the wayne firehouse but again, yeah oh okay yep Yep. I'm sorry. I, I use the term VFW generically. Well, no, I mean, I would. I <laughs> like VFW is like name. anything that is like a rental hall or, you know, something that's repurposed into a music venue. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I'm sure there's a flyer. There's a there's a website called the NGPP Archives. This guy, Joe Polito, put together and he like literally has every demo from New Jersey, like all these flyers from back nice. then. I'll have to look through that and see it. But but that must have been I remember wild. Two, yeah. I remember two things about that show. I remember that Adam and his package played. Okay. And I remember that Richard and Stephanie Rains from Drive, Drive Through Records, little cousin, was out in the parking lot talking loudly about how she was cousins with the people who ran Drive Through Records. <laughs> <laughs> Weird anecdote, but that's like the the one other thing that I remember. <laughs> what what year was that show? Do you remember? I don't. I'm looking. I think it was. Fire. I think it was probably um, post the stereo when the Impossibles got back together. So probably 2000 or 2001. I have to. I have to find this. Did you find it was? Um, it was. Which band did you find? The, the The question I'm trying to ask is how wild it must have been to play a club on a stage with a with a giant amount of like a decent amount of people watching you and then playing like a legion hall the next day because in my mind that's <laughs> what it was like for you but I can be completely wrong so was that true or not true Oh yeah absolutely yeah um, 
we, I mean, cause really we were at a level where playing big shows seven days a week was not a thing. Like our Friday and Saturday shows would be really well attended and we would plan it that way. Uh, but you know, when you're, when you're trying to scrape together a Tuesday or a Wednesday show, I mean, we played plenty of, uh, I remember playing, uh, Richmond, Virginia to literally no one, like not even the opening bands stuck around to be able to do that. And so that, I mean, that's, that's the sort of disheartening stuff that ends up leading up into, um, you know, bands disbanding. Is yeah. you, you put enough of those shows together and, and you just start asking yourself, what, what are we doing? Is Jamie back? Jamie, are you back in? I am back. I'm really oh. sorry. Uh, my computer decided to update. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I was wondering what I'm that like, like... <laughs> that scuffling was in the background. I'm like, I was like, Rory, why are you like moving shit around your desk? But it was Jamie coming back. In. <laughs> Here we go. We're totally back in sync. I'm actually using my phone now. <laughs> So, but it's funny because I just popped in the phone to replace, and the whole the way that the setup worked is like it's all back to normal. So, ah, well, whatever you want to call back in your computer, you want to call back in with no, dude, okay. my I got 13 minutes remaining on my update. So, oh Jesus, it just <laughs> automatically just started. It was like, hey, fuck I you. had it set to do that, and oh. I wasn't looking at the computer because I have got two, I'm running two computers here, one to record my my mic on this end, and then the other one just to run Skype sort of a funny way of doing it but it was the fastest way of doing it um and but i wasn't paying attention and, and then it just sort of like if you don't say anything i'm going to start updating in like 90 seconds and i just yep 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 and so i think it's one of the reasons why i mean there was many reasons why i stopped playing music back in the day but there was always that just that technical shit that you never thought of and it would just fucking happen and you're like I didn't think this was going to happen. Like you get up on stage and all of a sudden the, no, the, I know, the mic I know gets exactly ground. when it happens. It happens when an audience is watching you. Exactly. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's, it doesn't happen at practice when it doesn't count, but when it counts, bingo. Yeah. It's the thing that you weren't even like expecting. It just totally happens. You're like, what the fuck? So we had just talked about, I just asked Rory what it was like to play like Legion halls and like what it was like to play a club and then just show up at a Legion hall. And then, my thought was that you guys would be packing the house consistently because that's any band that I looked to, looked out looked to that was like their name was constantly you'd see them you could see them in zines all the time you knew of the record label I was like man these guys have it fucking made they don't they're not <laughs> struggling like us they're playing packed houses all the time but it sounds yeah, like that, that wasn't airplane 100%. thing I was talking about yeah you know, we gave you the illusion that everything was operating perfectly you know? well it, it yeah um, yeah and why not I mean that's I mean to be honest with you that's what marketing is you know like uh, you just you give people the sense of the illusion that this is the thing that they want and then they want it you know and it's like every asshole influencer on Instagram right now. Like, look at me. I'm like, <laughs> life yeah, is great, I mean, and they're so depressed. <laughs> we, well, we definitely were depressed. <laughs> um, you definitely so that, were depressed, you said. Yeah, do we yeah, no. do we just establish that the stereo were the asshole influencers of 1999? Yes. Yes. See? <laughs> I really want to do that comparison. Back. That rings true. I, yeah. I think it's there. No, but I mean, we just put the effort in into that thing where, you know, we were, we were songwriting nerds that wanted to be remain songwriting nerds and do it for a living. And if it required, you know, like 15% of work in this arena to sort of like perpetuate that, that, that dream, right. Then what is 15% of work worth? Like nothing. It's no problem at all. If, if all we have to do is have a conversation about the poster looking a certain way, or our our onstage garb or whatever you know what i mean like if all we have to do is have that conversation and then go yes you know then what look it's not new it's not like we invented outfits or we invented a white album or like i mean dude the beatles had outfits they had haircuts you know they're yeah. pretty popular they did pretty great <laughs> I've heard of them. Like, yeah. They've got like they've got a bunch of catchy tunes and like you know I really think they're going to blow up. Um, but you, do you know what I mean? Like we weren't doing anything that radical, not even at all. You no. know, if anything that we were doing that was radical is that we were applying it to sort of a subculture that that 
decided that those things were, you know, um, outside the boundaries of what they were comfortable with, which is so funny because like, you know, punk rock is supposed to be like all accepting and all, you know, no, no filter and all this thing and, and, and no rules. And like, there's some of the most rules you could ever find is in the <laughs> underground punk scene. You know what I mean? It's true. And so I, I always would chuckle at that to myself. Like, it's like, well, you guys sure are different, you know, with your everything the same, you know, like, so I'm not saying I was this, you know, I'm not David Bowie. We, we weren't David Bowie or that unique, but we weren't afraid to try a little something a little different. If anything, the reason we're talking to you today was is evident that maybe it paid off to a certain extent, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you guys like you had a slice. You have that slice of that time for a lot of people. Like they remember you. You can remember it the way you're gonna remember. It's like it. It Roy. I just cut you off for a second, but like it's like a family member that you know as you know as the annoying person or you know their flaws but everyone outside is like your uncle your cousin they're so funny your sister's great and you're like she's a fucking bitch but like you you know it's like you know it more from the inside sorry mike's sister yeah <laughs> oh, i love my yeah, sister but, but, that, but not listening so whatever no i'm just kidding I, no, i'm just kidding I, I was I wanted to, to circle back to a point that you were making earlier, Mike, about how there was this potential for us to stand on the shoulders of our previous bands and then kind of like launch into the stratosphere. And and that didn't happen with the stereo. I, I think our, our main claim to fame is, you know, mostly we were sort of a band's band, like bands that that really liked the stereo went on to do great things. And, and I think we had, you know, a positive influence on, uh, the, the label that we were on and, and some of the scene, but, but the band definitely did not get there. And I think a lot of that was some self, self-inflicted wounds and dynamics in the band kind of breaking down. And I, I don't know, it, uh, we're definitely rose colored glasses looking at the positive sides of it. I, I think they're, they're also, came a point where the band started to take a little a turn that ultimately kind of undercut all the promise that we had when we were first starting what do you, out. What do you mean, Roy? Are you saying I did something wrong? Uh, I, I wasn't <laughs> going to bring it up. <laughs> no, it, look, Rory and I, we made each other fucking miserable back then. You yeah. know what I mean? And and I don't, I, there's, there's no good way to say it. We're friends now. Like we've gone on vacation together and, and, and done all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but through, through the lens of being like mid twenties, when you're doing a band and you, and you're filled with this weird self-importance that, okay, what we're doing is cool. And, you know, we were sort of drinking our own Kool-Aid to a certain degree. I'm sure I was. And I thought that the only way forward was through sort of like a, a like over ambition. I think there was a lot. I know there was a lot of moments where where you know there was just no need for that sort of ambition under its own roof. You know, like being the you know like we'd be we'd be competing against each other just rolling down the freeway. You know what I mean? Like what for? How far into the band did that start? <laughs> pretty immediately yeah, actually yeah. yeah you think it was just, just sort of two... instant, instant love hate relationship there was there was a <laughs> lot of there was factors like I, it was just like two lead singer syndromes competing or totally i i, I mean the, egos sure um i also think like we were we were having to live together like we were doing this oh, wow. you know really super diy if if i'm going to be in minneapolis while we make this record that means i'm going to be on jamie's couch and yeah. There was just like, like there was no space and uh, there was no thought to comfort whatsoever. We just thought about what needed to get done. Yeah. You know, like like if you were like, OK, I have to do these 10 things. Right. You would just start working on the 10 things. But you never once thought to yourself, well, how am I going to I need food between some of these things. You just didn't care. We just OK, well, we got to go to Minneapolis because that's where the studio is. So we would just get in the van and go there. But we never thought about what how long we'd be there. We never thought about where Rory was going to sleep or how he's going to eat. We just went there. We just did it. Like we were like, it was kind of like, it was stupid. <laughs> we really, we really made no allowances for our own comfort and, and, and 
you, you know, just like comfort, I guess is the best word for it. You know what I mean? And so, and, and so when you're not doing that, when you're so blind to your own or the people around you's comfort, you're, you're also, you're just going to keep going. There's no, why stop there? Right. And so yeah. I, we just kept going like by the time we decided to do the band to the time we went on tour or like our first show and we had a band together, we had a record done. It was being pressed or it was pressed or whatever. I swear to God, it was like two or three months. Yeah. Like from start from like, you know, start to finish. Like, we're, okay, now we're operating. That is ridiculous. Really, that is ridiculous, especially back then, you know, when things aren't on the internet, when you can't upload the thing to mastering, when you can't, you know, all those, and when it's not Pro Tools and, you know, mix in the box and do recalls on the fly, you know what I mean? Like, like we, in that time, I traveled to Texas. We spent two weeks writing and recording the demos. Then we drove up to Minneapolis. We did that. And then we put together a band. And while we're putting together a band, I flew up to D.C. to have Jay Robbins mix the record. And we were doing artwork the whole time. And I flew back and we started rehearsals. Eventually, Rory did go home. And I think I started the rehearsals with the guys before you did. Uh, and then uh, and then we drove back to Texas to continue rehearsals with all of us and to start our tour. But we were like booking the tour as the record was being mixed, you know, there was like zero, absolutely zero comfort and zero uh, decision to like, go, okay, well, what are we going to do next? Or like, it was just like, get it done, get it done, get it done. We had to get back on the road. And I don't know what, why we decided to go so fast. I don't know. Maybe we were broke and we like needed to get that tour income happening again. I have no idea. But I mean, it was it, there was just zero consideration for anybody's well-being. <laughs> it was all about just doing the stereo now. And if you're not in the stereo, you're out of the stereo. It was so weird. Maybe you didn't want to take up such a break between the other two bands breaking up. You felt like maybe you didn't have any breathing room to to have that gap because then people would forget about you. It'd be like, shit, I mean, we got to stay on top of mind. That's a... I, I, maybe. I mean, I, I kind of feel like that would probably... Be be a little bit more thoughtful than I actually was about it. <laughs> I think it was just pure, just drive and stupidity. But like Rory, I really, and I'll say it on, I, you know, uh, I'll say it here too. I really do owe Rory a lot of, of both like gratitude, but then also like a, a big fat apology because like I was just relentless in my drive to get this thing happening. And like, there was definitely moments where like Rory got the short end of the stick because of me. You know, and and sorry, buddy, I love you now, man. Like, bros, but like, <laughs> love you too, then, Jamie. I, I, back then, I get why you were ticked at me. You well, know what I mean, like, yeah, and, and and I'll just say, me and Jamie have buried the hatchet deep on this. So I, I think you know, Jamie is has kind of acknowledged some of the ambition fueling him, and and I think on my part. I really got into antagonizing him and just, we just got into this like <laughs> adversarial relationship where like he he's pushing and I'm pushing back. And at the end of the day, it just ended up breaking the band uh, and ended up with me, me getting kicked out while we were touring for 300. Yeah. Well, that's, it's funny because I uh, hit my buddy Rob up and I said, Hey, I'm going to, cause I, Rory, as like I said, I'd never like let anybody know I'm going to do interviews or from an interview, but he, he's my buddy who introduced me to you guys. So I said, what questions would you want to ask? He goes, Hmm. He goes, this is Jamie. I'm assuming I go, no, <laughs> I go. And Rory, he goes both at the same time. I said, yeah, <laughs> he goes, that's nuts because Rory split after the first record. So I wrote interesting. It's Liam and Noah. <laughs> yeah. I, I split. Together. I love that. There's a, like on the Wikipedia page, I think for the band, it says something about me choosing to leave or something like that. But yeah. Uh, you can edit it. Yeah, it it's because uh, uh, I, I it's like when he asked that. That's again like when we first started talking. I was like, I'm gonna not, you know, I would I would gently have asked that, but you guys just, you know, it's just interesting no, you talk about we, that prior to this. Like Rory said, we've buried the hatchet. We've talked about this to each other twenty fucking years ago. I hope and so. all sorts of we we're totally cool now. And I mean, I I will never miss an opportunity to talk about how much I love Rory and, and how talented I think he is. And in some ways more than I'll even appreciate 
is responsible at least partly for a great portion of my musical career today. I don't think the dude from Animal Chin would be mixing records for Smoking Popes or whatever, but you know, the guy from the stereo might. And if it weren't for Rory helping me do that record, right, and me helping him do that record, like I wouldn't be here. So I owe Rory so much. I have a ton of respect for Rory now as an adult person that can, you know, use logic and reason <laughs> to make to help de uh, define my emotions better. You know, when you're 20, mid 20s or whatever, you're basically just like a tall toddler, you know, in some <laughs> respects, especially if you're a musician. <laughs> you know, like you, you have, you think the world is just there and you just, when I'm ready, I will just pick it up and it's mine. And, and a lot of young people do feel like that. I don't necessarily fault anyone for being, that's just part of growing up, you know, but when you're trying to, a band is like a business, like a small business in some respects, right? There are, oh, totally. there are deadlines, there are, are you know, there are timelines, there's, there, there, there are things to pay for, there are things to uh, come up with the money to pay for, you know, like, and, and it is, and there's other people's lives and just things that have to be coordinated logistically all day long. It is not simple to be in a touring band. I know that everybody who's ever seen a TV show when they see the band, it just looks like you know, the drummer walks on stage with his sticks in the back pocket and sits down, takes off his fedora and starts playing and you know what i mean it's like there's nothing worse than seeing a representation of of musicians on tv but the reality is that it's a tremendous amount of phone calls and work and email and you know the bands that do make it big they can kind of go into that baby land where they can act like do whatever they want and the world is their oyster but when you're at our level it's like you're like a truck driver, but it also works as like a, a promoter and entertainment lawyer. And you have 10 jobs mm. that have nothing to do with each other, but they all fall under the, the kind of the umbrella of being in a band. So when you're sort of emotionally unequipped to be an adult and then trying to do a hundred things at once with another guy who's also emotionally unequipped and trying to do a hundred things at once. And then when you disagree on some of those things, you get us, <laughs> you get the stereo. You're welcome. You get the you know? success that the success story that is yeah. the stereo. Wap, wap, wap. <laughs> Did you guys find though, that when, when Rory was officially kicked out as Wikipedia lies, um, did you find, <laughs> cause Rory, did you go right back to the impossibles? Um, very quickly thereafter, uh, we we restarted the Impossibles, and it, and and it kind of happened so close together. We sort of just that became the story was that you know I left the band, and you know I think that helped me save some face. wasn't entirely accurate, but at the time there was a lot of kind of just trying to put on a happy face and smooth things over and make everything seem fine. But yeah, so I, I we restarted the Impossibles. We started touring again. You know, we played a whole stretch of shows with the stereo in Florida. I think everything was fine. I, I, you know, I, I definitely was. Well, you definitely had your revenge, right? Because like we did that <laughs> tour, and you guys headlined over us, and the, the the stereo was supposed to be like, okay, it's Animal Chin and the Impossibles together, super group, right? Then you you leave. I'm air quoting right now. <laughs> the band and then go restart the Impossibles and your Impossibles come back we're like crushing the stereo. We're like, okay, well, that looks great. You know what I mean? So, but that that that's dude, it's the history of us. It's our band, it's our yeah. it's our we're talking about our joys and our our failures and our our heartache. You know what I mean? It, it is our story, right or wrong. It is what we are. It is what made us into the people we are today and i'm like while i i can kind of cringe at a lot of the quote-unquote bad haircut moments of it all at the same time it's still great that i got to do all that stuff it's still great that i was able to have a musical collaboration now that's last with with rory that's spanned thousands of miles and lasted 20 some years you know what i mean like there was a gap in the middle but like it's great. I, I love that first record that we did, but I, I have to say that also, you know, the records after I was kicked out of the band, once I kind of got over myself, Jamie went on to make really incredible music with that band. So and, good. And, <laughs> so good. I, 
com- completely blowing the stuff that I was doing after going back to the Impossibles uh, out of the water from my perspective. Like just from uh, the way the, that that record sounded was the biggest point of jealousy that I think that I had more so than ever getting kicked out of the band was just that, that the stereo could go on to just make these amazing sounding records that I just, I couldn't get there on my own, like without partnering with Jamie to, to do it. Uh, we're definitely bigger than the sum of our parts. And it's almost like the name, the stereo means a little something. (laughs) I I don't know what it is though. I can't. Yeah. I was going to say, it was like, I mean, you pretty much answered the, answered the question because you, when you, you went back to the Impossibles and you're listening to, you know, you're watching the stereo go and then the Impossibles are going, you know, have you guys found each other's writing, like there's your songs were like, oh shit, that's really good. So that's, sounds like you did. Well, re- rewind and record from my perspective is, is the best stereo record. Like that album is, is incredible. I, for now, thought, bro. I bought now. a uh, <laughs> I bought a German pressing of it on vinyl. Uh, I love I love rewind and record, but yeah, as Jamie's alluding to, we've actually started collaborating again on on new music, uh, and that that's a really great place to to find ourselves to to kind of at the after all this sort of turmoil and heartache for us to get over ourselves come back together and then be able to collaborate creatively is is pretty incredible and i'm i couldn't be more thankful with with how everything turned out those those records that were made in the past that that i still love but then also the music that we're able to make today wait so rewind and rewind record you guys are both on that Sorry, I didn't mean to get confusing. Rewind and Record is the record that came out after The Impossibles got back together that I loved, even though I wasn't in the band and had been kicked out. And I'll, and I'll just say, kind of begrudgingly loved. When, it, when that first when that record first came out, I kind of refused to listen to it. Like well, I, that's, what it I was want, on, that's what I wanted to find out. Okay, so he go He wants on. the dirt, bro. Well, not the it dirt, was, but like, the dirt. I wanted to know. If that's That was it. That's what I was trying to ask, was like, you're like, fuck. <laughs> yeah i was well at first i was just like fuck this i'm not listening to it right like like they put out a new record but i don't even want to check it out and then dan keys from recover came to me and he was like hey have you heard this new stereo record like it's actually really good we're all on fuel by ramen at this point and so he's bringing me a, re- a record that <laughs> yeah. came out on the label that all three of us are on and he's like this stereo record's really good and i was like ah you know is it like i, I don't really know how good a stereo record could be and he was like, like rewind and delete, bro. <laughs> he was like, no, really, this record is really good. And in and in that moment, I just had like a, a moment of clarity where I was like, I need to get over myself and I need to check this out. And I did. And it's phenomenal. Like you listen to that record. And if you didn't know from experience that it was made on a shoestring budget just because we were all making shoestring budget records at that point on that label, you would think that it was produced by Gil Norton or, you know, some famous mega producer. And really it's just Jamie through blood, sweat and tears, forcing it over the line, like pulling everyone with him into this space of sort of audio perfection that he had always been striving for. And I, I think he, he reached it on that record. Was that the record where... Oh, man, that's going to cost me so much. <laughs> compliment. I don't think I can do that one. Take take that off the record. It's too... too <laughs> Was that the record where you guys did the, the video, Jamie? Though it's online? Um, we did a video. Is no. that the one where I'm walking around? No, it's just like... Oh, no, New Tokyo. No, that 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 was in the in-between record. No no traffic. Oh, okay. Um, which... <laughs> God, there's a whole. Can we go off the record on no traffic? Do you want to? Yeah, can, can the record be <laughs> off? Like the actual record just be turned I, off? I, I, you know? I just don't know that there's a ton to say about it. It's if we had members from the band that were here during that time, there might be something. But that was, I mean, I'll just open it up. Like like Jamie went through a lot of of pain on that record. Oh, dude, I need some like like uh violins playing right now where can i cue that up <laughs> go ahead rory let me let me find this wait do you want to talk about that you don't have to talk about that me 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was just uh, it's typical band shit. I mean, just, you know, Rory, Rory had been excommunicated, banished from the hill <laughs> that was the stereo. And then, and then, so I, I think in some respects that gave me this weird, okay, now I'm in charge. I can do what I fucking want. I feel like at the time, the guys that were in the band, you know, they were my friends, but at the same time, I don't think they shared in my, they certainly didn't share in my level of ambition to do things. I don't necessarily think they probably shared my like sort of musical vision. And, and I'm not saying they didn't have vision. I'm just saying that they didn't share mine. And I, you know, I was just on this thing, this, this kick to do this and to do that and to do whatever. And anytime you're surrounded by someone and, and how, how boring is it to hear about the, there was the guy in the band that wouldn't take no for an answer. And he just kept driving them into the ground until the perfection it was lame. Right. That's what I was doing. Right. And I think they just were fed up with me times 10, you know, and fed up with my my trip, my bullshit. But I just wanted to get things done. And so we made this record under like like the worst possible, not the worst possible, but but poor conditions, at least for me. Um, we were recording it uh, in Milwaukee at the drummer's house who lived like six and a half hours from me or something like that. Oh, so like going to the studio was kind of a process, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and every time I would get there, I was sort of always filled uh, with dread, you know, so we would, the same things apply. You go in there and you cut your vocals. And I just was feeling so bad about being in the band at that point. Nobody seemed to care about the band, but me. And so it sort of, it, it effectively took the wind out of my sails so I wrote the record and like got a demo together with the guys and I was like, okay, this is cool. But then it was like, anytime you do a, sometimes you get demoitis, right? You, you make a demo of a record and you're like, okay, I've put it down. And like, well, now we have to do it for real. And you can kind of not live up to it again. And we did not live up to it, especially since I would go to the studio and I would be like, I remember one occasion I was there for like 10 minutes recording a vocal and it just was Sometimes when you go to sing a vocal, it's just not happening that day. Yeah. Either you you're just don't feel right or you, maybe you've been speaking too much on the phone and then you go up to the mic and you're like, oh, I kind of I kind of might have missed my little my apex here, you know, to do this. And maybe it was the song I was trying to accomplish that day and, it, and I, the notes just weren't necessarily happening. And I just like remember being there for 10 minutes and going. I feel like shit being here. I don't want to be here. I just have six and a half hours to do this. Fuck it. I packed up and I drove six and a half hours back and I didn't come back for like two weeks, you know? <laughs> yeah. But like, just because I was so just like, I don't want to be in this band today. Um, and so that record to me sounds like a dude that's going, can somebody else do this? It, it, like I had the whole maybe tomorrow vibe going. But then that's not a way to record a record. You don't want the, to capture for all eternity your foul mood. And that's what that record is to me. It's a foul mood. I like, I've, I've sort of dreamed of just like one day going back and re-recording it just so that I can listen to it again because I can't listen to that garbage. So just visually, uh, who did, did you do the, the cover for it? For No Traffic? Yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't. Our our bassist Jeremy at the time was the guy like our photographer dude. Okay. And so he took all the photography, but I was the graphic designer, whatever you want, you know. But yeah, it's completely it's all brown and turd like. I was gonna say like just you know, visually, it's a total total mess. So you know, I, of just yeah, I was awful. gonna say like I, I you know I do I'm a graph I do graphic design like full time like freelance and stuff and just looking at that that's like one of those records like when you're talking about the story i'm like man like it's if you were the one who put that together it's like it seems almost and if you were saying that you didn't put as much heart <laughs> i into was it. visually demonstrating the pain i felt within my soul and it's not to like shit on the design it's just like you get that feeling from it because it's very dark and it's like mm -hmm. it's not as clean as the first album so it's like a polar yeah. opposite of what that first album was visually and there was probably probably something to like i don't want to we can't repeat ourselves i don't want to put on another white album you know yeah. like so because we kind of did that with the ep right before that you yeah, know it was like it's all you know and we're you know strapped our 
our nuts to the ceiling with wires and you know all that stuff. Did you ever see that album cover? We're floating above. Yeah, it's right. It's on Spotify. You're both. You're just yeah, yeah. hovering. Um, so there was definitely like, let's just like take some pictures of the street. <laughs> like, <it> was, <laughs> you know, it, it was a very maybe tomorrow. You know, kind of approach to things, and I don't know, not a good. If there had been like a, a proper producer on the record, we maybe we could have been motivated, but it was me and I wasn't motivated. So I didn't feel the, I don't know what I thought. Like, I don't know why I w- went through the, 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 the motions of completing the record, to be honest with you, because I knew it wasn't good. It's weird. I've got a lot of like, I've got a lot of sort of like bodies and skeletons of albums where it's just like, yeah, let's let everybody hear this. This is great. It's not. And there's things I'm really proud of, but then there's definitely some things. And it, it's become a problem because like the current record that we're doing, um, if there's ever going to be a problem in the stereo again, it's going to be that Rory kills me for not finishing what we're doing right now <laughs> because it's been fucking years. Um, and it's it's because of things like no traffic. Like I'm just like, I will not, I don't want to like hit save on something that I have to listen to the rest of my life and have it be like a thing that I go, that could have been so much fucking better. And so I have this problem now. I'm not like this with anybody else's work. When people hire me to mix a record, you know, fake book, whatever, I'm deliberate, I'm decisive, and I can just I can just do the, the job. But when it's like our own stuff, it's like, you gotta, I, I can't be trusted. I'll never allow this to happen to us again. <laughs> I will not be in charge of that. You're too close. Way too close. You're too, it's, it's way too close when it's yours because then you're adding your, your, your emotion to it. Your, you know, I won't say ego meaning a negative thing, but like that, these things that come out, but when it's someone else, you can separate cause you could, you could help them hone it in because you're not emotionally like there's emotion attached, but it's not as, yeah, yeah. it's not everything doing it. Well, we're almost done. I mean, it's being mixed. So how long ago did you, did you record these songs? <laughs> 15 years ago or something. It's called Chinese democracy. <laughs> I, I sent no. the first batch of songs to Jamie in 2015. <laughs> okay. And to be but, fair, we, we yeah. demoed everything till about a year ago. You but know, I, do, like, I, you know. I do not want to kill Jamie. Yeah. And, and so I sent the first batch of songs to Jamie asking if he would mix them for me so I could just put them out just to have the new songs that I wrote out and then kind of you know history repeating itself jamie said wait a minute you know can we can we get back together and do this as a collaboration and do what we did in the stereo i I, there's no ticking clock on on my side like i i don't need this to happen tomorrow so the the process kind of playing out over a longer timeline really it's more organic and it, it keeps us from having conflict we also overwrote or... though like we wrote 35 yes. songs for this record like and i'm not right. saying like we wrote 35 songs and blah blah Jesus. blah but really it's just like four like like you know 18 of them were like little like a verse i'm saying we wrote lyrics and we demoed to completion with full harmonies and mixes for like 30 plus songs to the point where like we could have three albums and those demos are better than Wayne. most bands' albums. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to be. Why don't you just give them? Well, then we're. Why don't you just give it to someone else? Uh, like to mix, you mean, or 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 to other bands? I give I wouldn't want them. anyone else it. to mix it. Just to raise my hand real quick, Jamie. <laughs> You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Jamie no. is amazing at this. He's this so is good, this is like dude. where he's he, so he, good. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie is amazing at mixing stuff. I want him to do this. Everything that that he's done so far, it's it's taken a while for sure, but it's it's been worth it. It sounds amazing. So why? I, what's what's the you take take though? your time, Jamie. What's we, the we wall? Don't tell out. me that. Don't what's, tell me. Don't, Jamie, don't let my wife hear you say that. She'll kill me. <laughs> Because she's like, you need to finish this goddamn record. She's like, I'm about to start hating it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. She doesn't say that. She's a huge huge proponent of us and i love her well now you're gonna have the best this is gonna be out there because you have you know this this podcast is pretty current this will probably be out in a couple weeks so you'll have some people being like all right fuck yeah we want some new music so maybe i don't know maybe if people reach out to you they can you know help help you uh get more motivated yeah yeah. no i mean it's funny i'm looking at a track chart right here and everything's x'd in the only i mean i literally just have to finish the mixes 
and I have a mix for every song except for two. But then all of the mixes need kind of like a big once over to just to kind of bring them into consistency. So it's about a week or so worth of work. Yeah. But like finding finding a, a sort of an unencumbered week for me at the moment is, I you know, there's all kinds of kids are home from school. Like it's just like it, everything is, you know, there's new a pandemic. Baby and, <laughs> Got a new yeah, kid. It's a little complicated at the moment. And then oddly enough, and I'm like, OK, no one's going to call anymore for mixing or anything like that. But I've actually gotten a few things here and there as this is happening. I'm like, my phone's not stopping so yeah. <laughs> and i need you know i want to i guess support the family and so if somebody says i need a song mixed i'm like okay fortunately it's been pretty small nothing's really derailed it but i'm 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 rounding third on one last project which i literally just waiting to hear back if they like it or not or if there's like another recall and then i'm i'm not accepting any more work until the stereo record's done uh so so maybe so it, will, it will be done. I don't know when it's going to come out. This obviously the pandemic has has complicated matters. You know, normally you'd put out a record and then you would like do some shows to kind of help promote it. So whenever shows are going to happen again is probably when we would put it out. But who the hell? Zoom knows? show, bro. Zoom, Zoom it, show. man. You guys should totally Zoom. do that. The Zoom doom. <laughs> do the live thing that everyone's doing. It's awesome. Like you yeah, do. For latency, together. I think we already would have. You could still do. Oh man, there's that shit's still going on. Have you seen like Ben Gibbard's been doing one? I think every single day since this started. And Goldfinger did a very. I mean, sounds. I mean, obviously, yeah. what I just you guys put me through in the beginning of this. You're, you're obviously going to get the technical side, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, the Goldfinger. I think they had. Go check it out. They did here in your bedroom and in Superman. Yeah, I've seen those things. Fucking so, uh, awesome. I'm super 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 great i you know i and i don't exactly know the framework of the band or whatever but um i know you know they've obviously got some like very capable people in the band we're all in different sam and i are in the same city but everybody else is in a completely different city so and then you know sir chris our bassist he's not he would have to enlist some help in order to achieve anything like that on his end well i guess just do acoustic yeah because that's what everybody wants <laughs> <laughs> they want something well, they're bored out of their well, fucking mind well, that really that really cool pop loud rock band from the late 90s the stereo yeah let's 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 check this out but this time without the loud and i'll bet you they good. would <laughs> i'll bet you they would they'd they'd tune in for it on a facebook live or a youtube live but yeah shit i think i'm i think i'm out of i mean definitely not out of questions but i don't want to hold you guys up Okay, so was there any like random crazy story that happened on tour that you want to talk about before I uh, follow the, uh, ask the last two questions? Uh, so, Rory, do we want to mention what you're doing kind of in the background for this record? Sure. Okay, cool. So you, wait, why would you want to strike it? <laughs> well, so we are... Rory has sort of taken it upon himself to create and produce a podcast of our own about us. Oh, cool. Right? So there's a big gap of Rory's sort of tenure in the stereo and almost sort of like out of the, and by the way, correct me if I'm wrong in describing this, buddy, um, but out of a, almost like a sort of like desire to kind of refamiliarize himself with his own band. You know, he's got this big missing, like the Rory coma years. Yeah. It was like, this would be kind of a cool thing to just like, talk about the history of our band because the stereos as a band whatever we're a band right there's so many stories about bands you know legendary stories where you know keith richards did this and shot heroin into his ball sack or whatever he did, you know what i mean like like just stuff that's so beyond belief that it's like it's like you know, the, and then he dove off of a hundred foot cliff and wings popped out of his back and he flew away. It's completely just beyond the scope of reality, right? The Motley Crue stuff, the no yeah. effects stuff, right? Yeah. It's just, it's, 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 there's no mortality to type to stories like that, right? And they're fascinating and they're fun to listen to. And, and you kind of get a glimpse into like the, this, these fascinating lives of people that have lived kings, like Roman gods or whatever right greek gods sorry messing up my mythology um but then there's like our band 
right? And we weren't a local band. We were a touring band, right? We, we didn't just tour the U.S. We toured overseas. We did like 13 or 14 countries or something. And we had some notoriety, right? But we also had a tremendous amount of stupid stuff happen. Bad luck, self-imposed problems, all these things that are completely akin to what it is to be anyone, right? Like everybody has drama in their life. Anybody has, they toil through the, just getting through their lives, right? They have people that they have to work with that they don't get along with. They have these problems, right? I think Rory on some level kind of thought to himself, like, you know, there's so much here about what happened to the stereo and what the stereo caused on them, you know, onto themselves, uh, that it would be kind of a compelling story of what it's like to be in a band, not a huge, not Motley fucking crew, right? But like a band that kind of did get off the ground and did get in the van and did go around the world and did get some recognition, but didn't quite get there. That story hasn't exactly been told. Yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. a lot, there's a tremendous amount of like self-congratulatory documentaries about bands and then they did whatever, right? And like, but we don't have that. We don't have the big success where we, and then we played Coachella and the world became ours. Like, we don't have that. In fact, we have the, we got booted off Coachella <laughs> or Coachella. We didn't, but like, it, 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 do you know what I mean? Like we have these moments in our band where you're like, and just when you thought it was about to blow up, this person disappeared or this person flipped out and a tour got, you know, we got kicked off a tour and you just, you just like, oh my God, the stereo is literally record sale poison. <laughs> and, and, and we have all this influence on other people that did go on to do the crazy things that, and become, you know, whomever, whomever, you know, you, you is on the lips of people today. But um, we ourselves didn't didn't have that success. We had all of we did everything wrong every time. <laughs> and I think there's sort of like an interesting story there that isn't so rosy. That's almost in some respects more compelling to listen to. Like here's like this is the story of what not to do when you're in a band. <laughs> Right. Yeah. If you could have chose door A or door B and A being the right one, we always chose B. And at the time, it seemed like the right one, but it was it was not. And so, you know, and I will say I will add that there's one sort of documentary out there that I kind of think nailed this thing. And it's that uh, the story of Anvil, that doc, that movie about the band Anvil for the metal band from the 80s. That is the greatest music documentary ever. And it is what it's like to be in most bands, right? Maybe not most bands, but most bands that do anything besides play at the bar, you know, down the street. Like they had real things. They had managers, they had tours, they did things, but they never quite broke through. And the stereo is like the punk, th this podcast that Rory has produced, it's like the punk rock version of that story. It's like a, it's a band story for mortals, Right. Yeah. That that not not the Tommy Lee, you know, did this or whatever. Like, you know, there's probably some moments in there that are like, holy shit, he said what? You know, like in some craziness. I mean, just what it is to be in a band is like that some days. But for the most part, it's like normal people trying to do something extraordinary and not getting it right. And I think as a story, it's really interesting to listen to. There's a lot part of the reason that Rory and I have buried the hatchet is because of this podcast. We were very careful to not, we, we sort of buried the hatchet, but then we really buried the hatchet and we recorded mm. it. Mm. Um, there's a whole, the whole like second episode. It's like five episodes or it's oh, going to cool. be or something like this. And it's like the second episode of this thing. We go hardcore <laughs> into, <laughs> I fucking hated you. And I know you fucking hated me. And I was just jealous and you were just a big, dumb, poopy butt, you know, and on all of that. <laughs> I hope that's how you say it. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's well, a direct quote. That's a direct quote. <laughs> but, the, but Rory, in, 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 and I had no idea that Rory was so good at doing this type of broadcast material type of thing. Uh, because like, you know, I, he's like, okay, I'm doing this thing. And he did this interview and it was sort of like, okay, I guess we're just going to talk for a bit and whatever. And 
But then when I started hearing what he did, I, I knew just from the interview and the types of questions he was asking, I'm like, this would be kind of interesting for stereo fans to listen to, right? But then when I listened to like the first episode, which arguably actually is probably the worst so far because he got so good at doing the, the second through fifth ones that he's probably going to redo one to make it as good as the rest of them. But it was such a great like glimpse into what it is to be a band, right? And he and you have the time and space to talk about these things in a way that was so like sort of visceral. And it's like, and even like our band members are like, God, when I listen to this, it's like, I don't even think I'm listening to about our band. It's just an interesting story, you know, about growing up and being in this situation and trying to figure out how to do it when there's no rule book, you know, there's no one telling you this is the right way. This is the wrong way. Everybody had a lot of opinions about what to do, but nobody was necessarily right. Um, and certainly we were not right, but, but Rory's ability to tell this story, both with, you know, like narration and music and, and it's got original music that Rory put in there. It's, it's just like, oh, wow. it's like super, like if you're a stereo fan, this is going to be the coolest thing ever. It know? almost sounds like an episode of how I built this. Have you guys ever listened to that on NPR? Yeah, it's, 100%. I love that. So it's, it sounds like it's very just with little orchestrations and stuff because that 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 mm -hmm. takes so much time. I mean, when is yeah. this gonna when's this gonna come out? So I so the last two right questions. after the record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's holding it so, uh, see, me, me and I'm Jamie have gun, guns pointed at each other's heads. You go first. <laughs> oh, that's you. funny. Uh, no, yeah. The idea would be that we would kind of release it in tandem with the record, you know, just sort of like a promotional mechanism or whatever. But like. I've joked many times to her, like our manager and other people, and I said, like, I think I'm more excited about the podcast than I am about the record, because it's so different, you know? The record is great. I'm super proud of what's happening here, and I think people are going to be like, holy shit. But I also kind of think, like, mo like a, a band from, you know, a brand new band, they don't have this part of their band that we do. We have this, like, story. We're older. We have sort of, the, like, the, the scars to kind of prove our music a little bit here we also like we, I, I do think you know without trying to sound completely arrogant or anything i do think we made a somewhat of a mark on people certainly other musicians you know we're like you said earlier like we're sort of the stereo is sort of a band for other musicians you know like we were the band that influenced the band that you like <laughs> yeah but we're not the band you actually like we're the and, band that influenced the band you do like you know and jamie jamie brought up anvil the story of anvil and anvil the story of anvil starts with them talking to scott ian and lars ulrich and and these bands that that really took off and made it and we we have some of that too we've been able to to get interviews with some folks that were influenced by the stereo or fans back in the day who went on to fantastic success so there's an element where we're able to kind of pull that piece of it in, but then there's also just the really personal part where me and Jamie get to go through it and really talk it out, which for me was the most compelling part, trying, you know, trying to listen back to it and a really unique opportunity. I don't know how many, how many people get to take that person that wronged them when they were 25 and kicked them out of a band and then really deep dive on it and really talk through it like that. Uh, yeah. it was, it was a really, it was a really cool experience. I, I got to check a lot of boxes through doing it and hopefully it'll also be really compelling to listen to. See, I love that idea because Roy, we talked about this briefly. I think when Jamie's computer shit or updated, uh, uh there, or no, it was before we were trying to get him on. There's, um, Brendan from the Lawrence Arms, he's doing a breakdown of Lawrence Arms albums. And it's it's not like this, but it's just so specific to that band and it lives in this bubble and then it's going to be over. And I love that. I, I hope that a lot more bands start doing that because it's so fascinating to me. Like, I, I can't wait till you guys do it because I'm totally going to listen to this because that sounds just yeah. fucking amazing. Well, I think it's cool because like there's a lot of like podcasts that deal with these very specific sort of cultures and worlds and stuff like that. And then then there are other podcasts that kind of have like a, a the story, like the serial podcast, right? It's like yeah, one it's story, an right? End. And that was a, it, it, there's barely an end to that, but like, well, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> some but, some but, of them but, though. But yeah. that gripped everybody at a time when we were like, oh God, I know what's going to happen, right? And so I'm not saying that we're that compelling, but for music lovers, this is sort of like a case study in some respects, you know? Yeah. And, and whether or not you- And like what not to do. It, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whether or not you like the stereo or not is kind of pointless, right? This isn't the story about the stereo. This is a story about what it is to be in a band and make mistakes and have some successes, but then also have some failures. And so I kind of feel like this could appeal to anybody that likes music or like likes being a musician. You know what I mean? This is this could be your story. And it isn't self congrat We don't pat ourselves on the back. I mean, there's a little bit of it just to kind of give you the, the like, like Rory said, you know, like, you know, such and such from this band says we're handsome. You know what I mean? Great. Sweet. They're, they're the they're big shit. Great. That's just the con kind of like the context, whatever. But like this is more or less sort of like if you're a, a, a 16 year old kid and you have dreams of getting in the van and going out on tour, this would be a fantastic sort of like insight for you. You know, yeah, like I almost want to like promote this at guitar centers or something like that. You know, <laughs> not not. Do you know what I mean? Like this has no, it has nothing oh. to do with punk rock, really. I mean, it does. It's sort of a time capsule for some of the, this era. Well, it's like a how-to guide almost for like you. You really want to be a band? <laughs> how like, not to? Yeah, but like, or this is what you might be getting yourself into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's cautionary. To, it's, right? but it's also yeah. humorous and and like the funny shit that happens and the the you know like I mean and and in the grand scheme of things, the stereo was not so outrageous. You know, like we don't have the Motley Crue stuff. You know what I mean? But like. Again, they told that story. Motley Crue has that story. No Effects has that story, right? Like, they don't have our story, though. Yeah. And our story is probably more closer to what a normal person would experience than, you know, we, we are not that. We're this. And this is cool, too. And I, I don't want to be a, hair, a strung out heroin rock star. I want to be me, you know? And, There's still time, Jamie. There's oh. still time. There's right. always time to get strung out you, on heroin. Can you hear this peer pressure? This is ridiculous. <laughs> like, uh, I got the if, heroin if here. Anybody, if anybody is interested in these things and me and Jamie making music again or the podcast uh, whenever it comes out, uh, the stereo rock is pretty much what the band is listed on all social media platforms. So if you look for that on Instagram, Twitter, what have you, that's how you would be able to find out if slash when Jamie ever finishes mixing this record. <laughs> Well, also you all, the, 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 the housekeeping of the um, reach a set and the Instagram. And he, <laughs> he said that did not take it slick. And here you are with our handles and business. Yeah. Is, well, I'm Marie ATX on Instagram. You guys also are now, you guys aren't great at uh, or reading your Facebook messages. Cause I, luckily we were connected, but I actually messaged you on Facebook on March 14th. I was like, Hey guys, I want to do an interview with you guys. Let me know. <laughs> We'll have to talk to our Facebook representative, Jamie Wolford, about that. I've, oh, dude, I am the worst. I, I've, like, it, I've cast it, off. My wife picks up the slack, and then we're, we try, we'll probably try to get Adam to do more of that stuff. Well, you know what I mean? Once we sort of get up and running with the, the record and the podcast or whatever, I'm sure we're going to be like full tilt on things. Yeah. But, you know. You can reply to my message pandemic. then and let me Come know. Come on, man. <laughs> easy, easy on the pandemic, bro. You're going to get... You're gonna get a reply that says "hard pass." Yeah, I feel like sorry. <laughs> we're we're uh, we're working on our own podcast now, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I will. The second, well, I always ask end with two questions, but you guys pretty much answered it. Unless you want to add to this, so I always ask, "What would you like to promote?" So if there's, so obviously the podcast. Obviously, uh, we're gonna promote Jamie finishing the fucking record so anyone if you go to the stereo rock at any avenue just you can message and say hey jamie we you should really finish that mixing thing so everyone should do that and, <laughs> and i'll be like don't try to change me and then he'll answer my message eventually what uh do you guys want to promote or like uh, give a shout out to anything else it could be about you it could be about another thing that's happening outside of like your friend's doing or something you see that's cool I'll just like call Sam out Hardwick Jamie's as a person. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Chris and Sam that. are the most amazing bandmates ever. I think they only got one mention here, and we should say that we love both of them. Uh, I but, also but just one one more than the other, though, right? One more than the other. We're not going to say who. <laughs> wink, uh, wink. Jamie, uh, Jamie just makes a record for Ultimate Fake Book, which I think has hit digital he release yes. pretty recently. So I'll throw out a shout out for that. Rory's my PR now, so go for it, bud. <laughs> what else am I doing? What else am I up to? 
I'm in my pajamas right now. Is that kind of cool? Or <laughs> that works. Coronaware.com. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll end with the, the last question, which will be interesting considering how you guys were answering this earlier, but I end every podcast with this. Uh, what scene ethics do you guys hold on to to this day? <laughs> I, I Well, I mean, I, I think of it when I think of the scene, I think about DIY. I think about yeah. doing it yourself and not waiting to be given permission to do something or feeling like you have to be the expert before you can start taking the steps. And that, I mean, that is me today. I'm, <laughs> this is kind of uh, dad life boring, but I'm restoring a bathroom right now. Right. And I, I'm doing that based on some of the ethics that I learned whenever I started making bands and making music and, and putting things out and pressing seven inches and things like that. It's like, I, you just pick it up and you start doing it. Uh, I've started making guitars as well, uh, uh, making electric guitars uh, here in my house. And it's like that, I don't know that I would have that courage or that instinct if it wasn't for coming up in a scene where I saw Green Day putting out records and that were fantastic songs that I wanted to grab onto and go out and get more of without seeing, you know, them when, when they were putting out records on lookout, just doing that, that whole thing where it just felt like no one had to give you the, the big budget and the, the uh, marketing exposure that all the bands that I had known up until then had needed. So getting that, having it deeply ingrained in me, I think it still is something that serves me today fucking this old house over there in Austin, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I watched a lot of this old house me. videos. Yeah. Uh, no, it always looks shit. easier on YouTube than when you actually do it. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so far the plumbing is holding up. <laughs> oh, I hate plumbing. I'm the worst at it. Me too. Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, our, I think our entire band is actually built on the idea of like, we'll just do it ourselves. You know, like we, we drive ourselves, we record ourselves, we designed ourselves. We, came up with everything ourselves you know like we had to and lots of bands have to and that's from our work there's no there's no musician there are musicians that have like been like what's the least amount of effort i can do in order to get the furthest possible you know the, the, there's like for every million stories where some people are just toiling away trying to figure this out there's like one you know like fiona apple apparently got signed off of her first demo tape she handed out <laughs> like really a lot of legwork there you know what i mean like but that story is the exception that proves the other rule you know that that if you want to get anywhere you have to work your ass off you know nobody's just going to hand anything to you you know nobody's going to convince you or uh, or, or uh, you're not going to convince anyone that you're worth anything without proving to them why you know and and sometimes the proof is hard work sometimes the proof is the work um but you know either way it's you working at it so if you're in a band today if you're a kid starting a band you know it is not your right to be successful just because you show up you have to work at it you have to the the the, the enjoyment of it should be the fact that you are there the enjoyment of it should be the fact that you get to do it uh, and play music with your friends. The stuff that happens because of that joy of that, that initial thing um, is just a bonus, but it's not your, it's not like a privilege that's been bestowed upon you that you're owed. Like it is something you have to go get if you want it. So just try your best and make the best choices you can and, you know, go for it. Can I go on the record as being on the pro Fiona Apple side of the stereo? <laughs> oh yeah, I love Fiona Apple. Don't get me wrong. Sure, me wrong. it sounds I like, like it. <laughs> Dude, I mean, I, I guess got, she got like, signed off her records. first demo. Way to try yeah. hard, Fiona. <laughs> I mean, it helped that she was immeasurably talented. So. <laughs>